Particularly um, for the Christian, think about that. It's it's nearly everything, isn't it? From I mean, we could go into the Scripture to establish this. As man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Motive. As a matter of fact, the Word of God, it's unique among all other words. My words. My words can certainly just simply go in one ear and out the other, or bounce off the eardrums. But the Word of God pierces deep. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intent. I'm talking about motive, right? Intents of the heart. So I want you to think of today. What motivates your Christian walk? What motivates your faith? Something. And for many of us, too often, perhaps for the very, very wrong things, I want to look at Galatians chapter 6 and begin reading in verse 14. We'll talk a little bit about what else is said here even in the uh, verses prior to that. But beginning in Galatians 6, 14. Paul said, Paul wrote, But God forbid that I should glory, save or accept in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. Stop right there, all right? So he says, God forbid that I should glory. Now that ha this statement has a lot to do with what he's taught and what he's reproved and what he's exposed prior in the, in the letter and what was going on among Galatian believers. Who like, like believers today, it's not a unique situation, may have been puffed up, um, considering themselves more spiritual than others, motivated by so many various things. And Paul reminds them, if you look back in verse 3, you know that that they're nothing. A man thinketh himself to be something. When he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. And so, uh, you know, he's telling them to bear one another's burdens. 
to, to be considered, uh, to consider others, esteem them of greater importance and greater need than ourselves, those sort of things. And then he, he, it leads him to this cumulative statement, this summary and this idea of, he says, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross. He's, t- he's saying, let's not forget what matters, the only thing that matters. And when this matters, it, makes, it gives everything else value. We're, we're so often focused on the wrong things. Because here it is. He says, uh, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. Now when you come to these passages in 2021, we might think that there's, boy, there's just no application here now because he, we don't have uh, Jewish religious believers now versus you know Gentile believers and we have to really debate and have a council on whether or not all the men have to be circumcised. So we might think that the teaching here is tossed out, but it's not because the principle is very, very pertinent, very active, and very much alive. Because what he's saying is, the reason we don't have to, to debate circumcision or any other tenet or principle or restriction of man that man has placed is he says that they don't matter. Not only the one, but the other. He says now a circumcision doesn't avail anything. He says, but by the way, neither does uncircumcision. Yeah. And, and it actually is notable that he throws that second one in there. Because uncircumcision is not a religious tenet. It's not a, it was not some principle. It was just the failure to practice something. Now there were those who were glorying and keeping the Jewish law and keeping it more than others or their heritage or their genealogy, you know, and, and what they had done prior to believing in Christ or in addition to believing in Christ that they think that they've added these things to this. So he simply could have said, you know, that, hey, for you Jewish believers, understand circumcision doesn't avail anything. I, I think that he, what he, so what he's saying is, you know, your good works don't amount to anything before God without Christ. Christ is the central thing. But he says, by the way, neither do the lack of those, you know, good, good works or keeping of, of the Mosaic law or the, or the commands. It's because man really cannot attain to righteousness without Christ. So it's not about what you do or what you don't do. You're standing before God. Now, so he says, as a many walk according to this rule. It's, I find it interesting that he uses that phrase. Now I'll say, it because, I'll say that because of this. He's re, sort of reproving the, the, the Pharisaical rule. The, the Jewish interpretation of the law and constraining Gentile believers to a host of things. Holy days and circumcision and other things. So in this letter... Paul had given strong reproof and instruction to those who were attempting to, rather than ministering to unbelievers, to attempting to constrain believers to, to their every tenet of their interpretation of the law. And his teaching, he turns them from the, the law of Moses to the law of liberty found in Christ. He turns them from abiding by the by their the religious leaders' rules for the sake of the rules alone to the Redeemer Himself and the rule of the Spirit and of the Word of God, the New, Te- the New Covenant. The Apostle was not lawless. As a matter of fact, he had been a Pharisee, and so he had really observed everything. Even while he's teaching others that, you know, that this is not necessary, he had observed everything. All of the commands of Scripture, old and new. But he saw clearly both in himself and others the futility of man's efforts at righteousness. We know from Paul's writings and how, how plain he spoke of his own inward struggle that Christ had shown him how futile his struggle at righteousness, his attain, trying to attain unto righteousness was without the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he's not lawless. But yet here we see him, we see this phrase, walk according to this rule. He's saying, here's a good rule for your life. If you guys are all arguing over the rules, here's a great rule for your life that that would would really help everyone if you would apply it. The man who was telling believers that keeping all of the rules wasn't enough tells believers to walk according to this rule. And when he says it, when he gives his teaching, he isn't quoting the law of Moses yet. He really is because the law of Moses was for this purpose, whether man can see it or not that it hangs on these things. Well, the law and the prophets and everything, they all proceed from Christ and they all are an attempt to, as a schoolmaster, teach us Christ and we learn other things from it. We, we elevate ourselves rather than glorying in God. So 
He says, uh, he proclaims a good rule to guide our Christian life. The rule which he claims, he proclaims to be abiding by himself in verse 14 when he says, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's a reason this message, why I started when I came to the pulpit today and said, you know, it's been said that motive is everything because Paul gets to motive. And so, you know, we're, you hear preachers talk about, oh, are you going through the motions? And let's get spiritual but let's let's talk about what that motive really ought to be and here it is he said god forbid that i should glory save in the cross of our lord jesus christ and so this statement is made at the conclusion of a long argument given in chapters four and five against those glorying in such things as circumcision the keeping of holy days or whatever they feel felt that they might have accomplished or comparing themselves with other believers and so many Christians emphasize what seems to be important to them. But what seems important to you or I is really of no consequence. You may glory in the things that you falsely believe make you a better Christian than others. But it's sinful and prideful to do so. Back in Galatians chapter 1, Paul reproved some of the Galatians for a serious charge for accepting another gospel or a false gospel. One that had been changed. Now let me say this about most false presentations of the Gospel. They tend to have this in common. That they elevate man and emphasize man's performance and therefore feed man's pride rather than destroy it so that the grace of God may do something in them. Almost all modern, or not just modern, but, but false presentations or alterations of the gospel as presented in Scripture, rather than present Christ as glorious and man as sinful, they tend to elevate man and just move God in alongside of man as, as an assistant or a helper. Now there are two important points made by this declaration here in verse 14. Just quickly, you know, as he makes this statement, a negative and a positive, there's two, two important things for us to see. One, that we should not glory in the wrong things. And two, that we should glory in the cross of Jesus Christ. I mean, we should be super focused on it, in not just the church. But when I talk about your motive for life as a believer in Christ, if we could really get this, if we could walk according to this rule, I mean in the trenches, I mean at home. I mean with our kids. I mean with our neighbors. I mean at work. I mean in the store and in traffic. Under our breath, repeating, reminding, letting the Scripture sink into our heart. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross. In my words. In my conversations. In my conduct. In all of my deportment among men. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of Jesus Christ. Writing of this verse, Galatians 6.14, Gill wrote this. He said, The apostle, on the contrary, expresses his aversion to glorying in anything these men did, not in his outward carnal privileges as a Jew, nor in his moral, civil, and legal righteousness, nor in his gifts and attainments as an apostle, nor of others, or in any outward corporal subjection to any ordinance, legal or evangelical. His glorying and rejoicing were rather in the spirituality, the faith, hope, love, patience, order, and steadfastness of the saints than anything in the flesh, either his own or others. And indeed, he chose not to glory in anything save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, this was the rule of the Apostle's walk after his conversion. And in verse 16, he sends greetings of peace to those who would adopt the same principle. Now, when I said this, I say motive is everything. You might say, no, 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 it's not. It matters what you do. But motive, pretty much, in the end, will determine what you do. It will take over. It will rule. It will be seen. For the Christian, I would argue that it is a fairly true statement that motive is everything. That's, I'm not quoting Scripture when I say it's an old adage. 
You've got to be careful with those in the pulpit. You've got to be careful with those in spiritual discussion. And I use it as an example for, for these, this reason. I believe, I would argue that there's some validity to such a statement when it comes to our faith. We use the word motive. The heart, in other words, the heart is what matters. Jesus, the, the Pharisees didn't believe that. They didn't believe that motive. They thought they could conceal motive by outward expression. That's why Jesus said, you know, you look, you look on a woman, you've committed adultery. And they were like, whoa, whoa! You know, you think it, and you're guilty, is what he's telling. And so we see this principle, you know, that, that confirms somewhat the adage when it comes to our Christian law. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What, or this, it's not, it is not what enters into a man that defiles him, but rather what proceeds out of a man. I would say that motive matters. We try to conceal it. We never conceal it from God. So I want you to think about this. What is your Christian motive today? What, if anything, drives your faith? But when I, when I thought of this passage, something else come to mind, something else Paul said. When he said, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. The, the end intention of that statement is the same as this. It's not an identical statement. You know, what's, uh, God forbid that I should uh, glory save in the cross. And he says, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto men. They're not identical statements, but think about the end purpose of what the apostle was trying to convey. The result is the same. He's saying, glorify God in everything you do and say. Let that be your motive in life. Let that, let that motivate your walk. How you respond to everyone. I mean, think about it today. When we re if, you're, if, you're, if you've responded in anger, if you've responded in, uh, you know, in a spiteful way, or if you were distraught today, whatever, let's go back and revisit some of those things that caused that. And let's say, hey, I, I want to, in, in this situation, and in every situation, I want to bring glory to God. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of Jesus Christ. Consider how greatly today this would aid and benefit us in our own lives if we walked according to this rule. There's a good rule for our lives. In all that we said and did, if in what we said we would, only, we would seek only to glorify Christ, how would this change our words? How would this change our conversation? And what we said to others or about others as well about, as about ourselves. When we speak about ourselves, would we seek to glorify God rather than glory in our accomplishments, our accolades? Does your conversation promote you or does it promote God? If we practice this rule, not only what we said, but we practice this rule that he mentions here that he, that he gives in how we treated others, how would we treat men differently? In every situation, if we only concerned ourselves with how God would be glorified by our actions, will my actions elevate me or will they elevate God? If we applied this principle to our attitude, how would our spirit be affected? Could we ever rightly remain angry? Could we hold to even one grudge if we were seeking to give God the glory in our attitude? <coughs> Your heart today, your spirit, your attitude, even your demeanor. Does it glorify God or does it only work towards the seeking of your will and your way? How would we respond to others if we sought only to glorify God in how we respond to men? Paul gives us a great rule. To God be the glory. Yeah. To God be the glory. Something that mankind is very little concerned with, I believe, in our day. We are really worried on most, most of the time, how things affect us and how they make us feel and how the outcome is going to be for us. And Paul says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross. You see, God had changed the apostles' priorities and the gospel does that for all who will truly believe it and follow its teachings. The gospel will change everything about the way you think and the way you are and the way you see it, the way you perceive yourself and others and certainly God. The gospel seeks to destroy self-will, self-love, and self-promotion. Consider how powerfully Paul declares this change in his own life to the Philippines. To the Philippians, yeah, the Philippines. He gives it to them too. He gives it to us. <laughs> so Filipino chapter 3. 
For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. None. No confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh. I more circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Paul says, you're throwing all this stuff out here and you think you're something. And in this text from Galatians 6, he says, a man thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he's deceived with himself. And Paul says, you know, think about me for a second. He, he's really careful here. He's not doing this in a, in a proudful way. But what he says is, you know, if anybody had anything to glory in, it would be me. If you think you have religious, you know, qualifications and, and accomplishments to, to glory in, now I want you to think about me. Uh, everything that the law required, circumcised the eighth day uh, of the tribe of Benjamin, the stock of Israel. He says, I come from good stock. A Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. We learned that here. Right? Oh, what great zeal. And, and all of, he, he studied the feet of Gamaliel. He knew the Scriptures. But he says, you know what? I count these things but loss for Christ. And when you come to Christ, you will count all things but loss. That's what faith really does. As a matter of fact, he takes it a step further. He says, I count them but dumb. Everything that mattered to him was now nothing. Dumb. And Christ was everything. God changed his priorities. He had no confidence in the flesh. You see, if anyone had room for boasting among men, it would be a man like Paul. And he's not, as I said, he's not bragging because he says, I'm not trusting in these things anymore. These things don't matter anymore. People talk about, you know, big name preachers and accomplishments among men. It doesn't just have to be preachers to get caught up in this. I want you to think today what motivates your life motivates your faith, what motivates your Christian walk and how you respond to absolutely everyone beginning in your own home. Preachers ought to walk to the pulpit seeking to lift up Christ and His cross before the people. Teachers should stand before a Bible class intent on glorifying God and not men. Singers the same. But moms and dads, brothers and sisters, neighbors, the same. The gospel of preached rightly today will not turn your hearts to the preacher nor to the church, but to the Savior. It is often said that we should give credit where credit is due. And I, I, I believe today that's at the heart of the message as well. He deserves it all. To God be the glory. Great things He hath done. But before you can learn to glory in the cross, you must believe in what happened there. You're going to miss the whole point if you do what these... The people he's reproving are just practicing religion. And so you say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really try to buckle down and practice the religion of the cross. Well, the religion of the cross is faith. It's God's grace. Sufficient grace. God's goodness. God's riches at Christ's expense. Before you can learn to glory in the cross, you must believe, as I said, in what happened there, what took place there, the man there, you must believe in the sacrifice that was made. Know why that sacrifice was made. It was for your sins. It was for your and my pride. It was for us. If you truly believe, you can be saved. <coughs> Confess your sinfulness. Believe in Him to find forgiveness. It's a wonderful thing, but there's no praise in that. You ever witness to somebody? You tell them, you know, you know you've been forgiven. You know that you'll inherit it. And they say, what makes you think you're better than me? You ever have someone that responds? <coughs> I, I never understood that. I don't. I don't understand that. Why it's perceived that way. It's maybe man's perception of what religion is, and it's a wrong perception. 
because they look at religion as something that man has attained to. And for those who have genuine faith, we know that we finally had a day where we realized we couldn't attain to anything and we, we believed and we reached out and we fell down at the mercy of God. And if that's the case, if that's how you come to Him, how could we glory in anything? All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And I'll take you back to this statement from our, our text chapter. Now I begin in verse 14. I've, quoted, I've ref, referred to this twice. Back in verse 3. If a man thinketh himself to be something, that might be the problem. Yeah. When he is nothing. And re that realization will really help us. He deceiveth himself. You're not this, we don't deceive anybody else. <laughs> but we do deceive ourselves to our detriment. To God be the glory. God forbid that I or you should glory except in the cross of Jesus Christ. Let's stand together today.